Well, we did it. Welcome to the final lecture of Statistics 568 Design and Analysis of Experiments. We've made it to the epilogue, the recap of all that we have accomplished over these last 30 plus hours of pre-recorded lecture videos that I'm sure you've all been enjoying. So, let's get into this. So for today's lecture, we're not going to do anything too fancy. We're just going to go through what we've been discussing throughout this entire course, trying to do an overview of everything we've seen so far. And seeing as how it is about plus 12 degrees outside, I think we're just going to do it right here. So let's just jump right into the notes. How about? <laughs> All right. So what have we been doing this whole time? Well, where do we begin? We began. Apparently sunglasses don't work so well with uh, Microsoft Surface laptops, but uh, that's okay. Anyway, so we began with one-way ANOVA. It's nice, it's boring, it is what it is, right? In this case, we basically have K different categories that we're trying to compare. And we want to know, do they have the same mean or do they have a different mean? We don't know, but we can plug it into the AOV function, assume that we have a normal distribution, assume that all the variances are the same, and we can get an answer to that. Anyway, after that, right, we basically, I mean, what are the key things to take away from that? Um, the first is really that idea of contrasts, right? The idea that we can't estimate all of the parameters as we write down the model. So we need some type of a linear contrast. Um, we talked about in this section many different contrasts, including the um, sum to zero, where we compare every category to the global mean, or the uh, control group, where we compare all of the other categories to some control group. That's the uh, default in R. We also talked about the idea of polynomial contrasts. What in the world? Polynomial contrasts, right? Because if you have ordinal variables, we should point out that this is specifically for ordered or ordinal factors we can consider polynomial contrasts. We can look at linear, quadratic, cubic. You probably don't want to go much beyond cubic because usually uh, you're not going to see any too interesting behavior beyond that, and it would be very hard, very peculiar to interpret that anyway. But um, at the very least, the point is you can consider polynomial contrasts um, up to the, I guess, k minus 1, being k being the number of factor levels you have to work with. Um, these are all different ways that we can apply a linear constraint in order to estimate the parameters for our linear model. But what else did we do? Was there anything else interesting? Ah, yes. So we talked a little bit about um, the idea of fixed versus random effects. And beyond that, we did the great Cochrane's theorem which basically justifies this whole course. It's a good theorem. Right, Cochrane's theorem is basically saying that we can decompose this quadratic form, this sum of squares, into pieces. And these pieces are all going to be independent and have chi-squared distributions. And that means we can construct F-tests and we can do everything that we want to do in this course. Otherwise, we'd be in a little bit of trouble because we wouldn't have anything to work with. Now, there are methods that go beyond the F-test. If you want, you can use non-parametric methods in statistics. Um, there are rank-based methods. There are alternatives. We talked about generalized linear models at the end where you would need to use other statistical methods or probabilistic methods to run the statistics because you don't have the normal distribution anymore. But assuming we have the normal distribution, we are all good to go with Cochrane's theorem. 
And that is more or less everything we did in chapter one of the notes. That and a whole bunch of terminology, like what's an effect, what's a treatment, what's a, you know, whatever, I guess fixed and random, and things of that nature. Anyway, um, things got a lot more interesting when we got to multiple factors. Factors in chapter two. Right, because then we could really start to design some interesting experiments. In this case, right, we were able to do things like blocking, have multiple two-way or three-way ANOVA. Um, we could do Latin squares and whatnot. So how do all these different designs kind of fit together? Well, remember, they're not all just distinct in the sense like we're going to do one design or we're going to do another, but they're all really just building blocks that can be used to put together to create a... Um, well, a greater whole. So what are some of the designs we looked at? Well, we looked at, for example, the randomized block design. Randomized block. And the key thing about the randomized block is that we will test every treatment block and treatment and block level combination. So in this case, we are trying every single setting in some sense of block and treatment factor. That's something that we don't necessarily have the ability to do in every case, but if we can do it, it's great because it means within every block, we're going to test every single treatment and that's going to give us, well, more statistical power to figure out if there is something significant going on with our treatment variable. Now remember, mathematically, the treatment factor and the block factor are really just the same thing. It comes down to how we want to interpret these different factors. So for our treatment factor, it's something experimental that we'd want to test statistically. Um, however, for a block factor, it's more of a term that we would use to control the variation in our experiment. So, um, for example, the treatment factor would typically be something like if we're testing out medication, we want to see how it affects our subjects. The block factor would be ways of reducing the variation among our subjects. So rather than just test everybody at once, we might specify and test older people and younger people separately. We might test males and females separately, knowing that they may react differently to the experimental, vari or experimental factor being the hypothetical medication that we're feeding them. Right, so it's really just a way of trying to control for more variation in our data, right? If we were to just randomize our complete group of subjects, it's very possible that we would have an imbalance with respect to some blocking factor. Maybe more old people were in the medicated group and more young people were in the control group, and that could skew the results. Um, but the key thing is that when you can't do blocking, you always want to try to randomize as much as possible um, in order to try to avoid such confounding, right? We wouldn't want to make have a treatment group with all the old people in it and a control group with all the young people in it and not actually account for that in our data, right, in our design. That would be bad. Um, and of course, we talked a lot about confounding in later chapters. Anyway, um, yeah, that was more or less the point of that. Of course, there are a couple key things to note, right? The randomized block design is something that we've already done before in the form of a paired uh, two-sample t-test, something that you probably would do in STATS 101, where you just have pairs of, um, of uh, subjects. It's sort of like... Um, if you're testing eye drops, right, you can test in the left eye and the right eye of each person rather than giving me a bunch of medicated drops and you a bunch of placebo drops, we could give one of each and randomly put one of each in, I guess, one of our eyes, each of our eyes. Um, and then as a result, we can control for the variation among our eyes because mine may react differently than yours to these eye drops these hypothetical eye drops that I like to bring up. Uh, we also talked about the two key one degree of freedom test. It's a useful tool because remember, I forgot the one, there we go. The two key one DOF test. 
This is actually a really nice tool to be aware of because typically if you are running a randomized block design and you're not replicating it, then you're not going to be able to test for interactions between the block and the treatment variable. Now, typically we assume there is no interaction and it's reasonable to assume that, um, but it's never 100% sure. And there could be cases where there could be an interaction and at least the two key one degree of freedom test will give us a hint at what might be happening if there is a, at least one type of interaction and then also determine whether or not we should replicate our study to then test for an interaction in more generality. All right, we also talked about the idea of two-way ANOVA. There's nothing really much more going on there besides the fact that we now have two experimental factors. Um, and then we did things like factorial designs where we would have like K experimental factors, right? So you can just keep expanding these things. Um, but more interestingly is one of my, my personal favorites, the Latin square. So the Latin square design, right, is set up in the idea of having two blocks and one treatment. And it literally comes from like cutting up a uh, plot of land in an agricultural study. So if you're trying to test to see how well your plants grow, whatever you're growing in your um, hypothetical farm, right, um, you might want to test different treatments on them, different fertilizers, say. But you have to account for the fact that across your field, things may change. You might get more sunlight in one part, less sunlight in another. I'm getting a lot of sunlight right now, so let's hope I can hold out because uh, I've been in the basement for a long time. Anyway, there could be that factor. There could be changes in the water, the moisture, the, um, the um, how the field is oriented, right? So the idea of a Latin square is to cut up that field into little pieces to address such variation at different parts of your field. Now, agricultural studies are all well and good, but we don't spend all of our time doing agriculture these days. There's a lot of medical studies we would be interested in or um, analyzing, say, business data or other areas, economics and whatnot, where we might be interested in using designed experiments. And the Latin square still has a lot of uses outside of agriculture in the idea of having both um, two different block factors and a treatment. Now, ultimately, you don't need to have them be strictly two blocks and one treatment. You could have two treatments and one block, or you could have three treatments, which would look more like the factorial designs that we talked about in the latter sections of our course. Um, again, mathematically, all of, these, um, all of these factors work the same way. The difference is how we interpret them, and also the fact that at least with the Latin square, we don't have the ability to test for interactions unless we were to replicate it. And what that means is that we have to be a little bit careful, right? Because if there are interactions, then that can lead to erroneous results in our data analysis. Um, so typically when you have block factors, you're assuming that these block factors are not interacting with your treatment. Whereas if you have two different experimental factors like two different types of medications that you're giving someone, um, there's the thought that they could have some interaction. So that's really the main difference there is, are, they go are the factors going to interact or not? And do we need to try to detect that? Um, and of course, we talked about how the Latin square can be extended to the Greco-Latin square and the hyper-Greco-Latin square, depending on if combinatorics will be kind enough to allow us to do that, um, which oftentimes it is if you have at least a prime power. All right, other things we talked about included the balanced incomplete block design, the BIBD, because I don't really like writing out balanced incomplete block design. And in this case, right, we were saying that I have a block, I have something like a randomized block design, but there's a problem. I can't test every treatment in every block. It's not going to work this time. Um, and that can show up in many cases. There might be 
just a, again, a, um, a surface area problem. Like if you have plots of land, you may not be able to have enough land to test all of your different experimental factors. Um, if you're, say, running a judging competition, right, and every judge has to test a bunch of, say, ice cream to see which one they like the best, well, if you have lots and lots of different flavors, every judge may not be able to taste every single type of ice cream. So instead, you would use an incomplete but balanced block design. And the balance is important here. The, all of those equations that we talked about in that section give us a balanced design. And that means that not only is every treatment seen in the same number of blocks, and every block sees the same number of treatments, but also the number of treatment pairs occurring in each block well, the number of pairs occur an equal number of times um, throughout the design. And that's important because we would ultimately want, if we have two different treatments, uh, we would want them to occur within the same block so we can compare them within that block, right? Because the block is going to control for that variation um, rather than having to compare the treatments outside of two different, or between two different blocks where there could be some con confounding issues there. So all of the balance becomes really important because, again, it allows us to properly test the differences between two different treatment levels um, within our blocks and to control for such uh, variations. Plus, mathematically, it makes everything orthogonal, and that makes the design nice to use. Right, we also had the split plot design in this section. And the split plot is really a randomization method. Right, so the idea, again, comes directly from the idea of literally splitting a plot of land in half. What we would have is that we have some factor that we can only coarsely randomize rather than finely randomize. Um, the typical agricultural example would be if you wanted to, say, apply pesticide to part of your field you might not be able to apply them to small little plots of land, but instead you have to dust an entire half, say, of the field. <laughs> so in this case, the idea is that if you had to apply certain factors to wide stretches, um, it's going to be harder to randomize it. And because we have coarser randomization, we have to consider that when we analyze our data. So again, if you just look at a split plot of the data, coming from a split plot design, you don't know a priori that it's coming from a split plot design. And it's one of the main reasons why you can't analyze data unless you know how it was collected. And that's maybe like a key quote for this course. You can't analyze the data unless you know how it was collected. Um, and in the split plot, again, is one of these tools um, where we changed the way we randomized to make the experiment more convenient to run. Now, we can always extend the split plot or take the split plot, I guess, remove it from the agricultural section and apply it in other areas. Because if you're running an experiment in another field, um, there's still a good chance that you're going to have certain factors that are easy to change and certain factors that are hard to change. Um, and if you are forced into that setting, you just need to make sure you understand how to set up your data, how to set up your experiment, how to replicate your experiment, and then analyze your data at the end of it. Um, this is in contrast to the um, nested designs that we did, because we also talk about, talked about nested factor, nesting. And nesting is really coming from the factors themselves. Um, so there is a difference. Both of them have this idea of a hierarchy, whole plot, subplot, and nesting has that same hierarchy idea. Um, but the key thing is that when you're nesting factors, things are a little bit different here. Um, because here it's coming directly from the factors, the idea that certain factors are nested within others. The example I like to use is if you wanted to look at teacher performance in school, you could get some sample some students and then you could assign well maybe block the teachers in half by you know the new fresh young teachers and the old seasoned experienced teachers and you want to know well does one perform better or does one 
have produced students who perform better on some standardized assessment. Now, if you consider the fact that if you're collecting data from multiple schools, now we have that the teachers themselves are nested within the school. So you don't have the same teachers in each school. They're all stuck in a single school. So in that case, we would have a nesting going on. We would have a school at sort of a higher level and the teachers, let's say the old and young teachers, nested within each school. But this can show up a lot in practice, depending on how an experiment is run and how the factors are dealt with. And again, it just staring at the numbers that come out doesn't tell you if there is nesting. Um, you have to think about how the data is collected and how the factors are um, interact with each other to know how to run your experiment. Um, lastly, in sec chapter two, we also talked about ANCOVA, or the analysis of covariates. And COVA. So in this case, the idea is, is that, well, we might have covariates that we want to include in our study. And that's a perfectly, well, reasonable thing that we would want. Usually a covariate would be some continuous measurement. So if we're running some type of drug trial, maybe we want to con um, get some continuous measurements about the subjects, like their resting heart rate or their um, weight itself, um, the rate or weight, uh, or their other measurements, like their age and years or something up to maybe the day, like fraction of years. Um, these are all different covariates we could consider collecting and including in our model. And in this case, every covariate would take, well, one degree of freedom um, to test, right? Because we have a continuous variable here. It means we would need one degree of freedom to test all of those. So we just have to make sure that we have the ability to include those in our model. All right, so that was all of what chapter two had to offer. Um, then we moved into chapter three, the uh, fun little mini chapter on multiple testing. All right, so chapter three on multiple testing. This is a fun one, right? And what we did was we considered, I mean, it's probably the most useful <laughs> chapter in this entire course because it's the one section that sort of transcends uh, design of experiments and will apply in so many other areas of statistics, including large-scale hypothesis testing in very many different areas. Um, so what did we do in that section? All right, so chapter three, jackets off and hats on, because it is actually kind of hot out here in the sun. Granted, it's only like 12 degrees, but that's basically summertime in Edmonton. Anyway, chapter three was all about multiple testing, and there are really two different methods that we, or two different um, areas that we focused on. We focused on the idea of the um, family-wise error rate control, and we also considered the false discovery rate control. Now, family-wise error rate historically comes first. It is the um, more classical approach to multiple testing corrections, the idea being that we want to control for the probability of getting at least one false positive among all of our hypothesis tests. This makes it a bit conservative, right? Um, and this is why people, well, it's an easier topic to comprehend and to work with than false discovery rate, but it also leads to more conservative testing methods. Not necessarily bad, um, but you do have to be careful if you're running large-scale hypothesis tests um, because family-wise air rate control may be a little bit, um, well, overboard. You might miss some, uh, some significant results that you, um, would go lost because of it. Anyway, um, the main idea is to reduce the um, threshold for rejecting our hypothesis tests, right? And we considered multiple methods. We considered the ever, the classic, if um, extremely conservative, Bonferroni method, which I may or may not have spelled correctly. I can never remember if there's two Fs or two Rs in that guy's name. Um, right, we've got Bonferroni, we've got SIDAC, which was a slightly different method, but had to assume independence among hypothesis tests. Now that's something that we often get, 
when we do designed experiments. If our experiment is balanced, if we have this orthogonality in our um, design, then what that means is that all of our hypothesis tests are in fact independent tests. And that's great because um, it means we can use uh, more sophisticated family-wise air rate control methods, including also the FDR methods that we'll talk about later. If we don't have a balanced design, uh, then we have to worry about the fact that our hypothesis tests will be correlated and we can't use all of these methods. What we also had, besides these two, we had the idea of step up and step down designs. And these designs include Holmes method, a classic approach. And with Holmes method, right, the idea is it's like Bonferroni, but we're doing it stepwise. We're starting at the smallest p-value and we're working our way up to the largest. And it's called a step down method because I don't know who came up with the terminology. I always get it backwards. But yeah, it's a step down method. Um, maybe because we're starting at the most significant and working our way down to the least significant, um, which would be numerically backwards from small, starting from the smallest p-value and working to the biggest p-value. But um, regardless, that's the idea. Um, now, we had those methods. Um, but we also introduced the more sophisticated false discovery rate methods, um, such as the BH, the benjamini hochberg method, and the BY, which is the benjamini Yekutieli method. Um, the benjamini hochberg method, again, is one of the most popular modern tools in statistics. It allows us to control false discovery rate, which is just the percentage of rejections that we believe are false rejections. So that's a really good thing to remember, right? If we have a family-wise error rate at 10%, that means there's a 10% chance that we have at least one false positive among all our rejections. If we have a false discovery rate of 10%, it means that we have a about 10% of our rejected hypotheses were falsely rejected. Right? And what it means is we have um, a much, uh, let's say, less conservative method. Which is great. Unless you live in Alberta, which is all conservative, I guess. But typically, you know, people love the uh, FDR methods in uh, modern hypothesis testing because they allow you to, well, reject more hypotheses uh, and not miss anything that um, is on the cusp of, say, significance, uh, especially accounting for um, doing lots of tests. Anyway, this stuff super useful. Uh, try to remember it uh, outside of the context of this course because it can show up in really any part of statistics because just about every part of statistics there is hypothesis testing. All right, so that was a little mini chapter. The next big one we did was uh, chapter four. And chapter four was on factorial designs. So in this case, the idea of a factorial design, which I think might actually go back to people like Fisher who proposed the idea, is kind of like, why test one treatment in an experiment and do that, let's say, k times, when we could just test k different treatments all at once in one super experiment? Uh, and that leads to the idea of the factorial experiment. Now, we considered mostly in this course the two to the k designs, where we have, well, two to the k observations, we have k different treatment or different experimental factors that we want to test, and then two to the k rows, each corresponding to a different treatment to assign to a different subject or whatever in our um, design. But of course, two to the k is often really big. And typically, we don't really care about high order interaction terms, as I've said multiple times throughout these lectures. So instead, we have our two to the k minus q design, the fractional factorial method. The fractional factorial method, again, allows us to reduce the sample size, and that's great. But the, this comes with the idea of aliasing. 
and things get messy because it means that you're no longer testing for the significance of a given main or interaction effect. You are now testing for an a the significance of an alias group of main and interaction effects, which can be a little confusing to think about. But if done properly, we can keep things like the resolution of the design high, and that means we can at least get some good interpretability from our ANOVA table. Again, we typically would believe that the lowest order effect is where the significance is coming from. So trying to keep the low order effects aliased with only higher order effects will, in some sense, be a good design. Um, Right, so the idea here is that there's this idea of resolution. And in practice, right, the resolutions that people care about seem to be three, four, and five. Beyond five, it seems like it's overkill. Um, well, three is sometimes a little bit too low, but if you really need to keep your sample size small, you can go for a resolution three design, certainly. Now, uh, we also looked at the three to the K designs and the three to the K minus Q designs. And really everything there is exactly the same as before, except it's a lot more complicated because we have three factor levels and we have to worry about the various complications that come in there. Choosing a fractional design with three level factors is more complicated because again, we have to worry about all of the complex aliasing that will occur. In this section, we also talked about the idea of, um, in this case, polynomial contrasts. And the peculiarity of partial aliasing because when you have polynomial contrasts, well, when you have interaction terms uh, with three or more levels, level, leveled factors interacting, that means you have more than one degree of freedom. And that means you can alias some of the degrees of freedom and not alias other degrees of freedom. And we get this peculiar partial aliasing problem where you can get correlations among the polynomial contrasts. And as we saw in many cases, you have to be very careful about the order in which you analyze your, um, you, well, you write out your ANOVA table unless you use things like type two or type three ANOVA, which was another topic that we talked about, which I'll put in here. Um, recall that there's actually a type two and type three ANOVA. Man, it looks like my pen is running, but it's a, it's not a real pen. <laughs> That's peculiar. Anyway, maybe it's getting too hot in the uh, direct sunlight here. All right, so where were we? Well, again, yeah, so there's a lot of more complications that come in when you have more than binary factors, and these are all different little, little peculiarities that we have to be aware of and we have to take into account. But ultimately, the same ideas are the same, or the, the, the ideas are the same as they were before with the 2 to the K design. Right, so after that, oh yes, we moved into response surface, and response surface is a, another one of my favorites. I really like the response surface methods. Because the response surface, right, is going to be different than the other designs that we considered. All of the designs up until this point, up until that point, were really concerned with testing for the significance of some experimental factors, some treatments. Um, in this case, right, we are optimizing That is so weird, the little, huh, whatever. Um, right, the response surface is a method for optimization, which makes it a little bit different than some of the other designs we've been using. And the goal is to fit a 
quadratic surface. Um, to our, um, I guess, design space. And okay, right, we can do that, but we have to do that by very carefully selecting the design point. Because again, we're always working under the assumption in this course that we don't want to collect a lot of data because it take, costs money and it takes time and we're kind of cheap and don't really want to, well, just collect tons and tons of data. So instead, we have to very carefully decide how do we pick points in a design space in order to fit a quadratic model? Um, and we can do that. We can do that in multiple ways, including, well, the main one that we talked about, which was the central composite design. And the central composite design is, um, well, the main one we talked about because it combines different topics that we had already discussed in this course. We have a 2 to the k minus q fractional factorial design in there. We have three level factors on the axial points, right? We had, uh, in this case, it basically combines like three level factors and 2 to the k minus q fractional factorial designs together. Um, recall that this case we had three different types of points. We had the, um, the cube points, which looks like cab, cube points. We had center points. And we had um, axial points. And all of these, recall, serve a specific purpose when it comes to designing, to running one of these experiments. Right, so the central composite design has these three different types of points, and recall that they each serve a purpose, right? The cube points are for the linear and interaction terms. The center points are for the variance, stabilizing the variance calculations so that we can actually get a standard error. And the axial points are for the pure quadratic Um, points in the, or um, parameters in the design. I mean, you can think of the axial points as our three level factors. And remember, we need three points in a line if we want to fit a quadratic contrast to it. And that's basically what's happening here, right? We need three points so that in a line so that we can fit the quadratic, the pure quadratic pieces in our um, response surface. Um, now, there were other methods that we talked about. We also talked about the box Benkin design, which was a combination of the BIBD with the uh, 2 to the K design. And we also briefly talked about the uniform shell design. And the uniform shell design was just basically saying, I can just have, um, take all of my points and uniformly spread them out on a sphere, a hypersphere, a circle, depending on how many dimensions we're working in. Um, and it's another way to, another legitimate way to fit a um, response surface design. Now, these each have their pros and cons. Um, the uniform shell can be kind of hard to figure out optimally because it's not necessarily easy to figure out how to uniformly space a bunch of data points or design points, I should say, on a hypersphere. Um, Box Benkin has the issues of the BIBD, which can always be a little bit tricky to fit. But ultimately, these are three different methods for fitting response surface surfaces to data. Um, there are others out there, and of course, you can always try to combine them. Now, uh, the key thing to also note is that you often have to use response surfaces in a search type 
method because just because you choose a certain part of your design space to fit a response surface does not imply that you're going to find an optimum there. So you may not find an optimum and you may have to then move to a new portion of your design space and fit another response surface in order to try to find that optimal value, the min or the max that you're seeking in order to minimize or maximize whatever you're trying to minimize or maximize, I guess. Um, but yeah, so response surfaces are a lot of fun, I think, to fit and they combine so much of the tools that we've looked at in the previous parts of this course. Other than that, um, yeah, we just had some of the special topics in chapter six. Chapter six was my grab bag for everything else that um, I didn't have time to fit into any, any other part of the course. And we talked about the idea of prime level designs. So again, you can have a two to the K design. You can have a three to the K. You can also have a five to the K and a seven to the K. Typically in this case, we're not gonna wanna have high powers of five or seven because that means we're gonna have to collect that much data. And again, we're assuming that data is expensive to collect. So 25, that's reasonable. 125, eh, maybe not. 625, definitely not. Um, and with right seven, once you get beyond 49, uh, it's not, it doesn't really make sense to run one of these large designs and you're typically not gonna have a whole bunch of seven level factors anyway. But the point is, is that um, again, methodologically and mathematically, everything follows as it did from before. Um, more complicated are the mixed level designs. I mean, in some sense, you can always create a mixed level design trivially by taking all of your factors and then just tensoring them together to create a super design. But the problem with that is you often would have an extremely large sample size requirement. And again, we wanna keep the sample size smaller. So we talked about two different settings. We talked about if you have two and four level factors, then you can kind of fit them together in clever ways to reduce the sample size. Now, again, when you do this, you have to worry about interactions between your factors. If there are interactions between your factors, that can lead to a problem in your design. It could mean that when you're analyzing your main effects, there could be other influence from those interactions. Um, but if we can assume that you don't have such interactions, then it is perfectly fine to try to do one of these designs and reduce your sample size as much as possible. We also talked about the two and the three level designs. In this case, you don't have, well, divisibility because two and three are both prime numbers and hence they are relatively prime to each other. And that means you can't be kind of sneaky and sneak a bunch of three level factors into a two to the K design like you can with four level factors. But you can still take, say, a three to the two design and a four to, or a two to the three design, which would be what? Eight times, is that what I want? Eight, no, I want two to the two and a three to the two, which would be a four times a nine, and that gets me my 36 run design. Um, and there's many different ways that you can squeeze two level and three level factors into 36 observations. Again, assuming that we don't have any issues with interacting terms. We talked a lot about those orthogonal arrays. They're complicated and they're kind of arcane tools that I'm not going to be emphasizing on during things like the final exam. So uh, don't worry too much about things like orthogonal arrays, but it is good to at least be exposed to them so you get a sense of the combinatorics and the algebraic side that's underpinning a lot of um, experimental design. Right, because uh, you know, whenever you're having a meeting and you're thinking, okay, what should we teach our statisticians, right? We need to teach them probability. We need to teach them calculus. You think, okay, we probably don't need to teach them like rings, fields, modulus, you know, Galois theory and stuff like that. And yeah, the answer is you don't really have to teach that in the stats program, but there are still applications of some of those really cool algebraic 
theories in statistics and specifically in design of experiments because of all this sort of discreteness and um, the concept generalized ideas of orthogonality. But um, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked um, because I like all this stuff too much. The one of the last things we talked about was the placket, which I think has two T's, Berman design. And the placket Berman design, it remember, is like two to the K for non powers of two. So again, you have 24 data points. You have 48 data points, right, that you want to collect. It's not a power of two. You can still do a factorial type design using the Hadamard matrix, a very cool tool that shows up in lots of different areas of applied and pure mathematics. Um, yes, it also I mean it's the key underpinning of the Plackett Berman design. And they're kind of hard to construct, but luckily there are R packages that'll do it for you, at least as long as you don't need too big of a Hadamard matrix, uh, then you'll be just fine. And these designs are used, well, why would we want to use them? We'd want to use them because we'd have a finer control on our sample size, that's good. Um, the downside is that we get very complicated aliasing among our interactions. Um, so our main effects are all going to be, in this case, independent of each other, but we're going to have some crazy dependencies among our interactions. And there, we're going to run into some trouble, and we have to be very careful when analyzing such designs. Typically, these designs are used for screening in the sense, in factor or variable, yeah, factor screening, I guess, in the sense that we can test a lot of different experimental factors on a small sample size to determine which ones may or may not be significant. Then we take the most significant ones, and I don't mean significant like it has to have a p-value less than 5%. I just mean you can look and say, okay, these factors, maybe the top five factors with the largest sum of squares associated with them, right? And then we can take those and say, these had the most interesting behavior in our Plackett Berman design. And so now we can do a more proper follow-up study rather than have say 20 different factors, which would just be a killer if we tried to do that in some sort of proper um, um, factorial design. So again, these often are used for screening but they do have other uses as well. Screening designs. And that was more or less it. We also briefly talked about the idea of the GLM or the generalized linear model, um, which is when we have non-normal data to deal with. And this is a key thing. Like I said, in past versions of this course, I've ignored it because I've been running out of time by this point. And it's taught in so many courses in our statistics program. But when you have data that does not follow a normal distribution, you have to work harder to analyze such data. Um, we can transform our data. That may or may not work depending on just how um, not normal our data appears. Um, and if it fits into one of these other parametric paradigms um, that allow us to use a generalized linear model, then it's perfectly fine to use that. And we just have to remember that when we use a generalized linear model, we no longer have F tests and sums of squares. We then have deviances, which are log likelihood ratios, and we have asymptotic chi-squared tests. It's a subtle point, but when you're if you can, if you, ac if you actually have data coming from a normal distribution, then the F test is an exact test. It's kind of like the right thing to do. But when you have data that's not coming from a normal distribution, the F test is only like so good as how close you are to a normal distribution. Similarly, in well, not similarly, when you're dealing with a generalized linear model, the chi-squared test is an asymptotic test. So the likelihood ratio, the deviances that you're looking at, do not have a chi-squared distribution. They only do so 
in the large data limit. So if you have a very small data size, sample size, you do have to be a little bit careful when you're doing things like testing with GLMs because you don't strictly have a chi-squared distribution. You just have something that will become chi-squared if for a lot of data. And lastly, um, we had that extra bonus lecture on the crossover design. And the crossover designs are quite neat, I think. They're a little bit different than the other things we talked about in this course because now you're trying to test lots of treatments on a given subject. And you have to do that in a very careful way again. Like almost everything in this course, it's like we want to test this experiment, but we have to be careful. We have to know exactly how we're going to test each treatment on each subject in order to make sure we don't get into trouble with things like confounding or whatnot. In this case, we have to worry about random spiders that seem to be crawling on my laptop. Yeah. Um, we also have to worry about the idea of um, carryover effects, right? Because when you're testing multiple treatments sequentially on um, subjects, one treatment might still be in their system when, they're, when you're testing the next treatment. And then we run into lots of interesting complications with carryover effects, how to op optimally design a uh, crossover experiment, um, which takes a little bit of thought. And again, there's a lot more to that than what I presented in the last lecture. That actually reminds me, I also forgot to mention another topic that we talked about, um, which was optimal design. Because sometimes, again, almost like with the Plackett-Berman design, you have the ability to collect more data than, say, 2 to the k. You might get 2 to the k plus a few extra. Um, you might have an extra money in your budget to collect a little bit of extra data. And then the question is, well, what are we supposed to collect? And we talked about different methods of op or different optimality criteria, like de-optimality and A optimality and T optimality and G optimality. And there's like a hundred other crazy ones that people have come up with, all based usually on some determinant or trace or something of the design matrix, the so-called hat matrix, um, or other matrices that would show up in your design. Uh, this is a key thing to remember because Oftentimes, you don't have the ability to have a beautiful, balanced, perfect design. So what do you do? Well, you can try to optimize some of these criteria or one or more of these criteria and choose a design based on that. It's another legitimate way to design an experiment. In this case, it's often used the way we presented it was if you want to collect more data and add it on, more sample points and add on to as like a follow-up study, um, then we can do that, right? But um, we have to know what, what treatments to apply to our new subjects, and that can be a hard, topic, a hard question to answer. Um, luckily, we have these different methods, and we have computer programs that will find optimal designs for you or fill in the rows to get you an optimal design with, this, with respect to some criteria. All right. All right, and that is roughly Design of Experiments 568. It is uh, great that you stuck around and watched all these videos. If you're just watching the final video, go back and watch the other ones. I mean, what's the point of watching this one if you haven't seen the other ones, right? Um, but no, seriously, thank you so much for um, coming and enjoying and you know watching all of these. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you can use these tools when you go out and have to design an experiment for yourself working in, well, whatever field you're working in, because ultimately designed experiments, while we're kind of obsessed with the fact that they came from agriculture, they show up everywhere, you know, whether it's medical trials, whether it's economic consumer data, um, whether it is agriculture or otherwise, there are so many areas that you can use experimental design. And the key thing I think to take away is just to remember some of the key principles of the course, things like um, we don't want to collect a lot of data. This is not a big data course. So we want to be kind of cheap and efficient in the way that we collect our data. And that's almost the driving 
method beyond, behind this course. We have to watch out for confounding. We want to randomize as much as possible um, in order to, if we can't block, then we randomize, right? Um, and uh, so on. So ultimately, thanks again. I hope you had a great time and I'll see you in the next lecture course.